This week for EM and 5, we're going to talk about hip dislocations, and I'm mainly going to focus on posterior hip dislocations because they make up the majority. It's almost 90 to 95 percent of dislocations. And this is where the femoral head is forced out of the acetabulum and actually rests behind it. So there's two kind of mechanisms and presentations that I think of for hip dislocations. One is this very low energy, usually is adults with prosthetic hips. And the other one, much more concerning, is these high-energy traumatic mechanisms. And these are really considered an orthopedic emergency. The most common we think of is in car accidents. It's actually caused by the dashboard. So as the knee sits flexed like this, uh, the dashboard hits against the knee, causes that force to go back towards the hip and actually dislocates the hip posteriorly. And we have to remember that really significant force is actually required to dislocate a hip in trauma. So about 95% of these patients actually have other very serious injuries Think of like pelvic fractures, lumbar fractures. So you really have to do a complete trauma evaluation and probably even have a trauma consult on these patients. Now, this is in contrast to the low energy ones that I was talking about. Um, And depending on what your ER population is, you might actually see these even more commonly. This is going to be the adults with prosthetic hips. And this is a completely different story, much less concerning. Overall, there's really minimal mechanism. A lot of times it's just caused by crossing their legs, bending over, trying to get up from a chair, even flipping over in bed. And it's actually not that uncommon. About 2-5% to of people that have a prosthesis will have a hip dislocation, usually occurring in the first week or months after surgery, and a lot of times they're even repeat offenders. And the good news for us as emergency physicians is that there generally is a very good success rate in reducing these prosthetic joints. There's a much lower risk of other complications like associated fracture, and there's much less urgency as well because there's no risk of femoral head necrosis, for example. And unlike other traumatic dislocations, these patients can actually usually be discharged straight from the ER with follow-up with their orthopedist. Okay, so what do we do for an exam for these patients? They'll generally present with a shortened, adducted, and internally rotated hip, so it's kind of the opposite from a hip fracture. Things we're going to do, make sure that they have good sensation and motor, especially the sciatic nerve. About 10% of patients will have a sciatic nerve injury. And also check for bilateral good pulses. Usually just a simple AP lateral pelvis. X-ray is good enough, especially in a non-traumatic patient with a low energy mechanism. What we're looking for here is that we need to rule out a fracture. Fractures increase the risk of complications such as AVN, or you can either have fracture fragments stuck in the joint itself. Now, if there is any evidence of a femoral neck fracture, you cannot reduce that. That's because there's such a high risk of AVN if you happen to move that joint and further separate the femoral head. In fact, even just in general, about 10% of uncompensated dislocations have some kind of risk of AVN. And that risk goes up the longer and longer you wait to reduce it. Obviously, in a patient with total hip replacement, this isn't a concern at all. Now, if you're not sure, the best thing to do is just to get a CAT scan. That'll show you if there's any fracture and can really show you the positioning of the dislocation. So things that you should probably call ortho for. So number one, if it's that patient with the traumatic mechanism that we talked about, I would call orthopedics, possibly even a trauma consult. If there's any evidence of fracture, you have to call orthopedics. And lastly, obviously, if there's any neurovascular compromise. The other thing that I'll call them for is if I'm unable to reduce a prosthetic hip after a couple tries and things aren't going that well, they can usually have some other good suggestions to help reduce. So let's talk through some different options. Now, first off, let's just say that the most thing that will help you be successful here is adequate analgesia, and you can even consider conscious sedation can be a really good option for these patients. So let's talk through a couple different ways we can reduce them. One is the ALIS. In this case, you're going to have one person who's helping resist on the pelvis, and then you're going to be pulling up, basically placing traction on the long axis of the femur. You can do a little bit of internal and external rotation during this. It can help. One other option is even to have a third person put some downward pressure on the proximal femur. Sometimes that's another thing that can help a little bit. A lot of times to get a little bit better traction or just a better angle is you can actually have the person stand up on the bed. Just make sure they don't fall over. Another option is the Stimson maneuver. This is good for patients who are stable, obviously, because they have to be prone. And then you just basically apply the same force. One other option, the Whistler technique, this is where you kind of use the person's other knee as a lever. You put one arm underneath the affected leg and then raise your shoulder up and kind of elevate the knee, pulling traction on the femur. And lastly, uh, Dr. Henley proposed this method, the Captain Morgan method. You put your knee up on the bed and then you apply the upward force by lifting your knee up as you keep the patient's knee bent kind of up around your knee. So there can be some pretty significant complications, especially in patients that have that traumatic mechanism of dislocation. 
And even simple posterior dislocations can still have up to 20% of late development of osteoarthritis. Obviously, all these complications are significantly reduced in patients that have a prosthesis and a non-traumatic mechanism. So if you have a patient who had a hip replacement, you relocate them, and you can actually probably send them home, make sure and call the orthopedist. But the thing you need to do is give them hip precautions, and it's to prevent it from coming out again. So make sure you tell them to avoid bending over, pass, avoid twisting the leg in or out. So for example, crossing your legs. You can even suggest that they put a pillow between their legs when they sleep at night to prevent the leg from kind of falling over and crossing over the other one during the night. And again, make sure they follow up with their orthopedist. They might consider a revision surgery if this keeps happening. So here's some references for the techniques and complications associated with hip dislocation. And thanks for joining us this week on EM in 5.